Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume. And if you've been following the channel, you know that I've been basically gearing up to my 1981 video, which I did a couple weeks back. You can find it under the uh, This Year in Perfume playlist, or if you just go back through some of my previous videos, you'll run into it. And I feel like I almost got myself so hyped up to do that video. And I was so looking forward to that year because it's my favorite year that after I did it, I was almost like, ah, oh, and I just took a break from, you know, this year in perfume and I kind of put it on the back burner. And I also got to know a new house in the meantime. I got introduced to John Beeble and got to sniff some January scent projects, which were nice. I got to chat with him, which is a, a pleasure and an honor that he took some time out to do a live stream with me. You can find those under the, um, uh, under the live portion of my channel or if you go to the streams, you'll see that in there, or there's even an interview playlist that, that will be added to that playlist as well. So I've been doing some other things is basically uh, where I'm going with this. However, I wanted to get back in the saddle of doing this year in perfumes, and I was figuring that once we hit the 80s, we would go one year at a time because I would have so many fragrances. As it turns out, 1982, I only have a handful so to get us to at least 10 fragrances, we added in 1983. So this is going to be 1982 and 1983 ranked. And it's going to be my favorite fragrances to wear right now. If I just close my eyes, don't think too much about it, and say, yes, that one, yes, that one. And there's going to be some, some surprises in the ranking. Some of these at the very top are very new, too. So just because they're newer... I'm not taking away points. Actually, I might be adding some uh, bonus points because I'm just getting to know them and I'm excited about them. But uh, this is my ranking right now. I try not to think too much about it and just go with my gut. But remember, this can change, obviously. I'm not saying number 16, which this is going to be a top 16. I'm not saying number 16 is worse than number one. Number 15 is worse than number two. No, this is my just uh, personal opinion. Actually, I'm looking at this list. Every single fragrance here could be someone's all-time favorite fragrance. These are a list of amazing perfumes. Uh, we're right dab smack in the heart of my favorite decade, and it's only going to get better from here. So let's talk about some things that happened in 1982 and 1983. So in 1982, uh, this is how far back this is, and it's crazy when you think about it, but Michael Jackson's groundbreaking album Thriller was released, and it's funny because... Um, you know, I've obviously seen Thriller. I don't think I've seen it played a hundred times on repeat like I have lately because my um, my daughter discovered it on YouTube. And actually the entire video is like 15 minutes long or something. And, you know, the dancing, she's just infatuated with Thriller. I've seen Thriller a million times in these last couple months. Uh, breakup of AT&T Monopoly was ordered. Argentina invades the Falkland Islands. Uh, the first episode of Late Night with David Letterman debuts. Wow, that was 1982. The popular science fiction film E.T. debuts. E.T., that seems even further away for some reason in my mind. Um, Disney's Epcot is opened. Tylenol capsules laced with potassium cyanide kill seven in Chicago. I remember reading about that uh, tragedy. The Mary Rose flagship of Henry VIII of England is raised in the Solette. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. is decorated. The first commercial use of genetic engineering is launched when human insulin produced by bacteria is marketed. That was 1982. 1983, United States invades Grenada. Uh, President Ronald Reagan proposes the Strategic Defense Initiative. Mario Brothers was released as an arcade game in Japan. That was 1983. Man, I remember playing Mario as a little kid. I can't remember how old I was. Maybe four or five and just, you know, one of the greatest Christmas presents I think my parents ever got me was a original Super Nintendo. Uh, Mario and Duck Hunt were like the greatest things of all time back then. The U.S. deploys uh, cruise missiles in Europe at the um, Greenham Common Air Force Base in England. Brinks Matt warehouse robbery at Heathrow Airport making off with three tons of gold bars valued at $37.5 million. That is a lot of perfume, boys and girls. $37.5 million. I'll tell you what, uh, that would buy some fragrance. IRA bomb exploded outside Harrods on December 17th during pre-Christmas shopping season. The first mobile phones are introduced to the public by Motorola Company. That was 1983. 
My goodness. ARPANET officially changes the use of the internet protocol, creating the internet. That's a major event, I would say. Final episode of MASH airs. I love MASH. And uh, Cabbage Patch dolls are sold in shops and become a success. Okay, so that's some major events that ended up happening between the two years. So let's get started. But before we do, um, I just want to say my scent of the day real quick is one that I probably shouldn't have sprayed before this video. I'm not going to be able to smell anything else. Absolutely nothing. I'm not going to get to smell anything because this is an absolute bomb. This is all I can smell right now. And uh, I do love this fragrance. But I'll tell you what. There are some sweet touches to this perfume, but it's so well blended and it has this smoky, spicy, um, licory, ashy vibe that I just, leathery, that I just, ha you know, it's easy for me to overlook kind of those sweeter touches. And this is uh, Emouage Myths Man. Man, I will tell you what. Uh, Myths Man, I wore this to work today because uh, I do stuff like that sometimes. Sometimes I just get in the mood and uh, that's why I have the box as well, because I put the box in, in the bottle in the box and I took it to work. And you can see the dent I've put in this. The juice is right about here, uh, right above the beginning of the um, Mwaj logo. And this opens up with uh, chrysanthemum, which is a very interesting flower in some cultures. It's actually even a funeral flower. So there's chrysanthemum and iris, and that iris is absolutely stunningly beautiful in this. This is a very introspective fragrance. This is not a compliment getter. Um, it's not a fragrance that uh, you, you wear to, you know, uh, I would not think that somebody wearing fragrance to attract the opposite sex. This is not going to be a panty dropper. But uh, there is just something about this that I absolutely love. That LME in here and the ash combination makes it completely different from most amouages that you smell. Most amouages, you have to imagine that Omani silver frankincense, that very traditional Omani silver frankincense. This is completely different. The rum note and the vetiver adds this, um, well, the rum note on its own, I would say, adds this. Uh, modernity to the fragrance. There's this very modern feeling to it, but that leathery, ashy dry down um, with this resinous labdanum, it is absolutely stunning. Oh, and I just, I love this stuff. So I'm very happy to have this, very happy to know it, and I will review this one day. Emouage Mitz Man is my scent of the day, and I actually found, um, I found this while I was digging through some samples earlier. And this is a pretty cool House of Matriarch. Um, House of Matriarch cloth. So, yes, I am going to be using this today to clean off the bottles. I'm going to grab some... Um, I am going to grab some blotters. Sorry, I was not prepared. I did come home. Took off my... Um, dress pants and put on track pants so you have to forgive me for not having the entire outfit matching but uh, I had to wear the fancy clothes all day so I did want to be comfortable for the video okay so number 16 and again this is ranked uh, and this is a fragrance that whenever I was going through the boxes this actually made one of the presentation video on one of the presentation videos I showed the the box and the and the bottle um, and the box was not the short ingredient list, and it really got me thinking if maybe the same thing would happen as with One Man Show. I got the I got the new version of One Man Show, didn't like it. Got the vintage version, loved it. Absolutely, completely understood what it was all about. And they they, I think uh, that's the worst reformulation Jack Bogart has ever made. One Man Show. This one I wouldn't say is as bad, but I'm very curious if the um, if the older bottles maybe would, I would understand them a little bit better because some people love this stuff, but this is number 16 for me. It's from 1983, according to Parfumo. Uh, Base Notes has it at 84, but remember, I go off of Parfumo, and this is called Crizia Uomo. And for a house that I so love, you would think I would adore this stuff, and I just don't yet. It never really grew on me. I've uh, tried it many a times. I'm going to spray it here. I'm going to spray these because this is a special video. And I just need to mark the blotters here. So this is Crizia Uomo. 
All right, let's spray this bad. Man, all I can smell is mitts, though. I just completely sprayed my hand. Not just a little bit. Completely sprayed my hand. Um, <laughs> oh. So, this is basically, if you look at the color of the bottle, it gives you an idea exactly what this is. It is green. Um, there's a lot of this vintage Artemisia mixed with basil and pine. And that's kind of the trio of green notes that you get. But it's also very woody. It opens up slightly aldehydic, um, slightly citrusy as well. Sort of a easier opening. And that easier opening, you know, it really makes me think that um, um, maybe the vintage bottles of this, I would really understand what the perfume was trying to be in the 80s because I do feel like these reformulations sometimes play a big role. I mean, it's been proven over and over again, at least to my nose. And so I'm curious. Maybe it won't. Maybe it just still won't be my favorite. Um, but with this oak moss patchouli and this uh, leathery dry down, you would think I would love Crizia Uomo. And I just, it, I just don't. It just, um, it never truly clicked. It's probably my least favorite Critzia fragrance, um, but it's still, that's why I said still a fantastic fragrance, still better than 99.9% .9 of the junk that the houses are putting out nowadays. So even if I don't sell this bottle, I mean, this could still easily get used and I could fall in love with it. Um, but I just feel like it could be more. And I'm wondering if the vintage version is that more. So I will keep an eye out for that. All right, I'm going to put that right there at number 16. Number 15 is a proper fougere. Um, this is a fragrance that uh, if you're looking for a proper 80s classic fougere, I would put this right up there with the best of them. But there's just something, there's a spark from this missing, right? Uh, I wish there was a little extra oomph on this fragrance. It's still a great fragrance, but same situation as Critzia Uomo for me. Um, I've got the more modern version with the longer note listing, and since this came out in 1983, I'm very curious what the original version was like. Um, my bottle is actually distributed by uh, Eva Floor, which is the last distributor of this fragrance, and so the um, that's one of the ways you can tell it's a more modern bottle as well. And this is a fragrance called Enrico Coveri. Poor Ohm at number 15. And I paid about 60 bucks for this. And I don't think I would pay any more for this fragrance. Even though it's discontinued and harder to find. Uh, I It's just one of those DNAs that are just ubiquitous throughout my collection. I have a ton of stuff like this. And to be honest, if I was going to wear a fragrance like this, uh, I would rather wear Gucci Nobile or, you know, something along those lines. Um, this has this spicy, woody, proper fougere structure. It's got the uh, lavender. It's got the geranium. Um, and it's got the... I don't know if it has Kumarin. I'm guessing it does. Because it really feels like a classic fougere from the 80s. Um, it opens up with bergamot. I'm going to spray it while I'm chatting. Bergamot, grapefruit, and lime, and lemon. And the heart note is going to be... Pine, clove, geranium, cumin, basil, jasmine, lavender, and tarragon with a base of cedar musk, vetiver, patchouli, amber, sandalwood, and vanilla. And Enrico Coveri. And poor Ohm. Okay, let's spray this bad boy. Let's try not to spray my hand this time. Come on, sprayer. Ah. That was a more successful spray. All right, let's see. Yeah, instantly you get just that classic fougere. Yeah, I mean, this is... Um, yeah, this is class. I mean, if you like the classic fougeres, if you like uh, Zarius by Givenchy, that's another classic fougere you could point to. Um, if you like Lomani Porom. These sort of uh, green classic fougeres, even Gucci Nobile, I might throw in that list, um, you know. But this one has it does have a little bit of a twist. 
Um, but I, I would rather wear, you know, something like Smalto Porom, for example. I mentioned Francesco Smalto Porom being my favorite from the house. I would rather wear even that. It has that smoky kind of uh, dry down this. It actually does have a little bit of a deep, um, I'm getting a little bit of this deep, I'm getting a little bit more depth from it on card than actually what I remember on skin, but uh, still a great fragrance. Again, even the back end of what I'm going to talk about, fantastic stuff. Um, Enrico Coveri Porom, it's just so 80s, so classy. Excuse me whilst I hydrate. Um... But yes, if you're a fan of classic fougeres and, you know, a little bit more of that clove and cumin is actually coming out on card. I need to wear this again. It's been a while. But um, these are actually, believe it or not, these are the type of fragrances I like to wear in summer. And you can see the bottle again, that green kind of uh, association. You can, you can kind of see where they're going there. And there's the bottom of my bottle. Okay, so the uh, older bottles are going, are they're not going to say Evaflor. They're going to say something completely different. So I'm not 100% sure how long this fragrance was in production, but uh, it is officially, it says it was last marketed by Evaflor. So I'm guessing that it's officially discontinued now. Um, but if you're a fan of this DNA, Enrico Coveri, definitely one to check out. A lot more is coming out on card than on than what I remember on skin. I need to wear that one again. Um, okay, next on the list is going to be a 1982 release. Oh, and I should mention that Enrico Coveri Porom, uh, according to Parfumo, 1983. According to Base Notes, though, 1984. So Base Notes and Parfumo disagree again. Okay, next on the list, number 14. And number 14 on the list is... A house that um, doesn't get a whole lot of talk in the fragrance world. It kind of gets relegated to once you really dive into the vintage rabbit hole, like I have done. That's when people start throwing these type of houses at you. Oh, have you smelled? Have you smelled this? And the house is Arrogance Porom is the name of this one. They also have an Arrogance Womo from '87. This is Arrogance Porom from 1982. And there's a little bit of this, um, Arrogance Porom to me has a little bit of this, imagine you took a little bit of um, Givenchy Gentleman, right? Just a little bit of Givenchy Gentleman. I would wear, wear Givenchy Gentleman a million times over this. But um, let's say you take a little bit of Givenchy Gentleman and maybe a little bit of like denim. If you've ever smelled denim, it's that leathery Shepra. Um, original denim is a $10, $20 fragrance. It's one of the best cheapies money can buy. Uh, I have no clue how they make that kind of perfumery for 10 to 20 bucks. But uh, this is actually still available for purchase. And it's still available for purchase by the version that I have. So we've talked about this before on the channel. Um... But I think my bottle is somewhere in the 15-year-old range. It's my guess um, because it's marketed by First. And I, I think First started making Arrogance Pour Homme about 20 years ago or so uh, by The First. Sorry, that's the official name, The First. Um, and I do have a deep vintage, which I'll do a comparison video on one day. But um, even the deep vintage, I don't think I would go hunt it down. I think I would, you know, just keep this bottle for reference. Uh, it's Artemisia, it's spices, it's lemon, bergamot in the top. The heart is uh, patchouli, carnation, cinnamon, jasmine, sandalwood, and rose. The base is civet, leather, oak moss, musk, benzoin, coke, sorry, castorium. It says coconut, but it's not coconut. It's castorium with vetiver and amber in the base. And um, the way that the leather and civet and castorium kind of play together, some people say it reminds them a little bit of Aramis Aramis from 1964. Uh, this fragrance honestly feels like kind of a amalgamation, like a blend of a bunch of different fragrances. And, um, you know, honestly, I would rather wear all those other fragrances over this one. I would rather wear the original Aramis. I would rather wear 
Givenchy Gentleman. Uh, it does have that patchouli aspect, though. One thing I noticed. Yeah, it's got this, um, you know, imagine, imagine you took that Givenchy Gentleman patchouli, you took out the honey that makes part of Givenchy Gentleman, why I love it so much, and you added this green Artemisia um, and spices, and that's kind of what you wrapped the patchouli in from Givenchy Gentleman. You wrapped it in this, um, you know, this spicy green kind of shawl. And so it doesn't really have the honeyed aspect as much. It feels like maybe there's a little bit, but um, that could be this uh, combination of maybe cinnamon and benzoin. Um, it does, so it doesn't really have that honeyed element like Givenchy Gentleman. But once you get into the base, into the dry down from memory, you run into a fragrance that begins to show off more of that leathery Chypre like base. And that's where the comparisons to Aramis Aramis start to come out. That's where the comparisons to original denim will start to come out. So again, this is another one that I think it's a good fragrance. Um, but for some reason, whenever I want to reach for this DNA, it's usually kind of second and sometimes even third tier. That's why it comes in at number 14. And that's from 1982. All right, into some of the bigger names. Number 13. And... This is created by one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Uh, and this is arguably one of his biggest hits, but it's not my favorite fragrance that he's done. Uh, it's from 1982, <clears throat> according to Parfumo. And it is the Great Dracar Noir, which I have a vintage Cosmere version. You can see right here, distributed by Cosmere. <laughs> Um, spicy, woody, uh, kind of this, you know, one thing that will come to mind for people when they smell this is, um, this dihydromersinol note really makes a splash here in the eighties. This is only one year. When you think about this, you have to remember, this is only one year after Koros and Antaeus, right? So... Many people think there's this huge divide between what was going on early in the 80s and the fresh version of the um, 80s that hit from, from the late 80s. When you think about things like Aramis New West, uh, when you think about Green Irish Tweed, right? When you think about this, Dracar Noir, this sort of freshness that began to emerge. The fragrance I reviewed yesterday, thanks to a sample sent by Keith from Manly Sense. Thank you, mate. Uh, he sent me a sample of Cellini by Fabergé. And that came out in 1980. And there was this freshness even starting to emerge then. Uh, and so, you know, you look at things like Oscar de la Renta, Pour Louis from 1980. This freshness really started to emerge even early on. So even though my favorites are those animalic bombs because they're just so bombastic. And as a perfume lover, how can you not love Koros or Antaeus or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just, I mean... They're, 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 they're my fragrances that really speak to my soul. Those animalic bombs, animalic honey from Hugo Boss number one, which Pierre Wargnay made. Uh, he also made Dracar Noir. And that's the biggest thing with this is this um, fougere structure, but they wrapped it in this kind of uh, new kind of freshness for the 80s. And that's where that dihydromersinol, it was just a smash hit for the 80s. Uh, the folks that weren't wearing the animalic fragrances were usually wearing stuff like this. This was a big hit in the 1980s. It's, it was such a big hit. It's still available for, for purchase today. Many of these oldies um, that we're going to talk about are discontinued, but um, this one's still available. It's lavender, lemon, lemon vervain, artemisia, basil, bergamot, and rosemary in the top with, uh, well, let's spray, shall we? Coriander, juniper, carnation, jasmine, uh, and cinnamon in the heart with a base of oak moss, cedarwood, fir, leather, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, and amber. And I have never smelled, most people don't know this, but this is a flanker. Dracar Noir. Noir is the flanker. There is actually an original fragrance by Guy Laroche called Dracar, which I've never smelled. Um, but I've never smelled the original Dracar. Um... I would like to, but I'm guessing I'll probably be a little disappointed. Since it's an older fragrance, I'm guessing it's going to be a citrusy kind of, um, you know, style of something like YSL Pour Homme, you know, Eau Sauvage, 
Chanel's Poor Monsieur, that kind of thing. And Dracar Noir. Yeah, I mean, um, this, for me, uh, this is like where, and maybe many perfumers were playing a little bit with that dihydromercenol before this, um, but this sort of freshness from Dracar Noir really kind of set the stage, and you just saw a ton of, you know, these fresher style fragrances from the 80s. Pierre Bourdon called it a new kind of freshness, and it's interesting, whenever he made Cool Water in, in 87, I believe it was, uh, one thing that he says, and if you listen to him talk, he's very careful when he talks about Cool Water has some elements of Dracar Noir, but he's also very careful to say that he created it in his own way, in a way that was different from Dracar Noir. That was very important to him. That's how big of a hit Dracar Noir was at the time, that even Cool Water, which was arguably the, one of the greatest men's selling men's fragrances of all time. I don't even own a bottle because I actually used to own a bottle. It was one of my childhood fragrances I had in the 90s. Uh, I think I bought it. I think my old man bought it for me in 1996, if I'm not mistaken, 95, 96. Um, and then I used it for a couple years and then that was it. I just never got it again. Uh, but I do have experience with it, although I was a kid. It would be interested, interesting to smell a vintage bottle again today. But um, Dracar Noir, you know, this fougere freshness with coriander, juniper, carnation, jasmine, cinnamon. And um, yeah, I mean, Lomani Por Homme, I mentioned it earlier. That probably has even more to do with something like this than Enrico Coveri Por Homme. Uh, Lomani Por Homme, I think, is really kind of like a clone, if you will, of Dracar Noir. Um, and... I like this. I mean, it, um, it, it, it's, is it my favorite? No, but do I like it? Yes. I'm absolutely glad to have a bottle and I do wear it. Okay. Next on the list is going to be number, next on the list is going to be number 12 and number 12, uh, barely beat out Dracar Noir. It was almost a coin toss, but I ended up putting number 12 here because uh, the fragrance encapsulates a little more of the things that I like. There's a little bit more of this spicy, leathery, tobacco vibe in this. and But it's so 80s. Look at the color. Look at the color coding. So this is Quorum by Antonio Puige. And Antonio Puige put out Quorum in 1982. And I had to decant mine because, um, well, the sprayer broke in, in a fit of uh hulk like rage i ended up breaking it so i just had to decant it and so it is currently decanted um but i can still smell the uh, the bottle and it definitely has this uh 80s uh many people put this in there with the powerhouse fragrances the color combination is damn perfect with that gold uh this is a sebastian gomez creation according to uh parfumo but I think Rosendu Matu played a hand in this as well, if memory serves. Uh, it's Artemisia, cumin, bergamot, grapefruit, and lemon. And you will get that cumin when you first spray. Uh, you may not, unless your nose is really attuned, you may not even pick it up as cumin. You may just pick it up as this general green spiciness. Um, this 80s elbow pads, you know, plaid couches and plaid suits vibe. Uh, is always what I think about when I spray corn. There is a vintage carnation note in here with patchouli, jasmine, cinnamon, uh, sandalwood, and cyclamen. And then a, the base, which is, I think, the star of the show here. Moss, frankincense, leather, tobacco, and amber. And if you're a tobacco lover and an oak moss lover, this is one of the biggest tobacco oak moss bases in my collection. So, yes, I would love to really try a deep, deep vintage. I think my bottle... I think this bottle is maybe 20 years old or so. So it's not the newest stuff, but it's not like a deep 80s vintage either. But I really enjoy that one. Quorum and number 12. Number 11. Number 11 is um, a flanker of a fragrance that came out in 1971. Actually, this box is going to go up in the attic with the rest of the boxes. I admitted defeat and I put most of the boxes that were back on the side back in the attic. So this is going to go right there along with them. This is YSL Porom. Haut 
concentration. And so Haupt concentration is actually a discontinued flanker of YSL for Ohm, which came out in uh, 1971. So this came out in 1983. And uh, there are some people that uh, much prefer this. I, I don't, I haven't worn it enough to really make a determination one way or another. What I can tell you about YSL for Ohm Haupt concentration is that it has this um, almost extreme spicy mossiness to it. So, you know, this citrusy, spicy... Um, YSL Pour Ohm, if you've ever smelled Balenciaga's Hohang, they have a lot in common to me. And they both have this kind of citrus heavy, uh, but there's a lot going on in, in YSL Pour Ohm. You get a lot of herbs and spices. And so this continues with that theme, but the the rosemary almost feels oily in here. It feels like this oil skid rosemary with nutmeg, patchouli, tonka bean, old school vintage carnation, you know, these different woods, lemon, and I think what really sets this apart from the original is the original, I get much more of this like Brazilian rosewood, almost this smoother vibe. This comes across much dirtier. The lemon in the top comes across uber dirty, uh, comes across very uh, dirty and darker. So darker, dirtier, and that trend continues into the dry down. That mossy, uh, it's not this, it's not this like, uh, you know, cleaner, easier to wear, citrusy, petit gras and herb fragrance. There may be some petit gras in here, but I get much more of this kind of mossy, dirtier dry down. Imagine oak moss in the mud. Um, so, I mean, it's supposed to be haupt concentration, um, and and that's what they've kind of done with this. So I'm going to do a comparison video between the two one day, and I'm going to put the bottle over here, and I am actually going to put the box up in the attic once I'm done with this video. Let's see if I can get it back in its, uh, in its little holder. Aha! And the sticker's still on there, too. Okay. So you go over there, box. Um, next on the list is going to be a fragrance I do not have to spray because I'm very familiar with it because I just wore it recently. And this is called Missoni Womo. Missoni Womo uh, is a discontinued uh, fragrance from 1983. And it's leathery, it's spicy. I just wore it a couple weeks back. Uh, Anuj has bottles of this. Anuj at Enchante Perfumes, if you're interested. And you can see Orlane uh, made these Missoni fragrances. Orlane also made Derek. Derek and Missoni Womo are my two favorite Orlane fragrances. Um, yeah, it's leathery, it's spicy, but it has a very strange vibe to it. There's something weird about this fragrance to me, and that's the reason why it comes in at number... If you look at the note listing... Uh, you would say this could be one of Ramsey's favorite fragrances of all time. It's not. And the reason it's not is there's a strange combination of galbanum in the top, but the way that the galbanum mixes with the spices in this make a very distinct, um, almost like you're mixing like some sort of a sauce, you know, imagine the consistency of tartar sauce, right? Don't think about the way tartar sauce smells. But imagine the consistency of tartar sauce. There's something about the way that the woody green kind of, um, you know, strange mixture between lemon and basil and galbanum with this kind of spicy leathery thing in the base. And they have used cystus. So they've used some, um, they've used some, uh, you know, very resinous labdanum in the base. Think about the resinous labdanum used in OR Black, but I much prefer OR Black actually to Missoni Womo and Ambergris. And the Ambergris gives it this kind of sparkle. So, you know, there's juniper in here as well, so there's some freshness. It's not just a deep, dark, leathery, spicy fragrance. There is that, but there's also this kind of sheen, this sparkle. So imagine you have that tartar sauce consistency with sort of this, um, this sparkle. And, but in a leathery, spicy sense. It's very strange, very weird, earthy fragrance. Um, I like it. Uh, I, if you could see the box, the box is so 80s. 
just Google Google Missoni Womo and look at the box. Uh, this didn't come with the box because this I think it was a tester, if memory serves. Um, but yes, if you're interested in this, Anuj has bottles that are very fairly priced. Very, very fairly priced. Uh, some people try to charge double, triple what he's paying. Okay, next on the list is going to be a fragrance from Ungaro. And this is called Diva. And I've got a decant of this. I've decanted this juice somewhere. I'm going to do a video on this soon. But Diva is um, coming in at number nine. And it's kind of one of the uh, three or four headed monsters. Oh, man. I love this DNA. So this is kind of one of these three or four headed monsters from the 80s that I talk about when it comes to women's fragrances. So there's Diva in 1983. In 1984 then, Jacques Polge, who made the uh, Ungaro, Emmanuel Ungaro fragrances, Chanel basically licensed their perfumers to go make fragrances for Ungaro. And so they created, he created Diva first. This was the first from this DNA. Um, and then it was a hit. He liked what he did. So he took it and modified it a little bit and created Chanel Coco. Uh, and Diva and Coco are sisters. They're sister fragrances to me from 83 and 84. Uh, and then there were other fragrance houses that jumped on the bandwagon. So you got stuff like Paco Rabanne's La Nuit, uh, which is a beautiful fragrance. I've got the EDT and the EDP. They're both fantastic. My favorite of this DNA, though, and I've made no secrets about it, is Tietro Alla Scala by the House of Critzia. I think that's actually my favorite Critzia fragrance. Uh, it, it's so amazing. Unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's a symphonic masterpiece. The name is perfect, too. Tietro Alla Scala Opera House. There is this, um, there is this, you know, fat lady singing at the top of her lungs, but the most beautiful note you've ever heard, right? Uh, and you're sitting in the uh, in the suite in the opera house, and you're thinking about the history in the city that you're in. You know the opera house that was built hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and all of the uh, amazing, talented musicians that have made their way through that over the years. And you know, just Teatro alla Scala is is to me the perfected version of this scent DNA. But uh, it all started here, and so Diva deserves more love. The name may make it seem, may put some guys off, you know, that aren't used to wearing fragrances like this. Don't let it stop you. It is a beautiful, also Chanel Coco, uh, the original EDT or EDP from 84. Beautiful DNA. Uh, the note listing here is cardamom, coriander, tuberose, aldehydes, bergamot, and mandarin orange with carnation, jasmine, narcissus, orris, root rose, ylang ylang, and a base of oak moss, honey, musk, patchouli, Amber, iris, vetiver, civet, sandalwood, and vanilla. And I guess, you know, it's somehow, you guys know I'm a fiend for honey. I love animalic honey fragrances, and very few people did them better than the way they were done in the 80s. And, you know, this um, this is a perfect example of that. The way that the honey, and also for Teatro alla Scala, you know, but the way they use that animalic honey beeswax with this kind of cheaper construction, uh, and then, you know, that posh iris that just makes everything smell like a million bucks. And, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 uh, maybe also one of the most genius uses of civet in a sheeper. I love the way that the civet is used, especially in Teatro Alla Scala. The civet in that is mind blowing. You get it here too. Um, but there's something... You know, think about the fat lady singing with Teatro Alla Scala. There's something just, um, you know, the volume is turned up, but it's not breaking windows. It's not, you know, make it's not making the dog cry outside. It's turned up, but in a in and they just hit the note perfectly. You know, one misstep to the left, it's too it's it's not done correctly. One to the right. It's too much. They just walk that line beautifully. So, and it all started with with Diva, that DNA, to me, my opinion. So that's why it's at number um, nine. Number eight. Number eight is a Lagerfeld. I'm actually gonna dip a blotter in here. It's been a while since I've smelled this one. Let me just make a note of it. So this is uh, Lagerfeld KL. 
So number eight is Lagerfeld KL, and I've talked about this before. Again, beautiful bottle, and this is kind of that 80s oriental ambery DNA. Um, if you know, uh, if you know fragrances like um, Obsession by Calvin Klein, um, if you know some of Lagerfeld's other work, like for example, there was a masculine version of this called uh, K.L. Om. You'll kind of get the idea here. Um, there we go. You'll kind of get the idea. Um, this sort of spicy oriental for the 80s. And... Um, there's a masculine fragrance that came out the same year. Man, they, they knew how to do Orientals back in the day. You know, you think about things like Opium or even Youth Do by YSL. This is kind of following in those footsteps. Um, but geared for an 80s audience, you know, that powdery, musky, animalic growl that they did back in the 80s is, is evidence here. You know, and even the use of aldehydes and spices and florals, it just plays beautifully into that, into that oriental um, kind of benzoiny, labdanum, resinous, ambery, powdery, you know, it's a little bit of smoke, a little bit of frankincense to go with the incense, to go with the uh, oriental accord. Um, I would not be surprised if there's real ambergris in this. Styrax is sort of... Um, waxy, you know, um, imagine a painter kind of takes his paint, his paints and blends them together, you know, and the, the paint, the two paints blend together to give off this kind of, you know, waxy sheen, right? That's kind of what Styrax feels like to me in here. But of course, vanilla in the base, and it's a stunner. It's a stone cold stunner. Don't, um, don't uh, stop from checking that out just because it's KL for women from 82. KL Ohm is also worth checking out, but KL for women, don't overlook it. Okay, that was number eight. Number seven is going to be, I think, one of the greatest fragrances of all time. Um, and if you read the message boards on this, 99% of what's said about this is rubbish. It's made by, it's, it's said by people that don't understand perfume is the way that I would put it. Uh, or it's just someone who's kind of started their journey and this is too much for them. Uh, or they don't have an open mind. You know, they're used to smelling modern designers. And if they smell this, it just, you know, they fall out of their chair. They, they start spazzing. They can't take it. Uh, this is a huge fragrance. But uh, one of my good friends, Euro Rose, said the perfect, I think he described it perfectly. He said, this is the impossible fragrance. This is the fragrance that should not be. The note listing on this, the way it was created, the breakdown, all of it shouldn't work. Shouldn't work out like it does. And yet, it's beautiful. It's one of the most elegant, posh, um, regal. This is a regal fragrance. Don't believe the stuff you read online about. It's complete BS. Uh, and this is Gold Man by Amouage. And Gold Man is absolutely fantastic. Look at the dent I've made in it. I'm going to spray this in here. Um, even though I don't have to, I want to, it's been a while. Um, gold man is, uh, oh wow. I can smell it without even bringing it to my nose. It is a beast mode fragrance. It is, um, my wife thinks this smells like baby powder. Um, and, oh, you're just hit with this, uh, instantly you're hit with this frankincense, this Frankincense, dressed up, you know, in this powdery, floral, lily of the valley, jasmine, with dog rose, or what they call rose hip, orris root. The orris here is, um, the orris is one of the powdery notes that really comes forth immediately. But it's done in a way that harkens back to fragrances from like the 1920s. Think of things like L'Envent Arpege. Extra or uh, I know I'm mispronouncing that. Um, our page, I guess it, I, I'm not 100% sure how it's pronounced. My uh, French tongue will never 
not fail me, or, or I should say, my Texas tongue will never not fail me when it comes to trying to say French words. Um, but, um, and I have a bottle of the X-Ray, and it's technically an aldehydic floral, but I've called it a Shepra before, and I think it's kind of true. Uh, there are some Shepra, you know, tendencies, but they lean towards an aldehydic floral. And many people compare this to Chanel's number five. I'll take this over Chanel's number five any day of the week. I think this is actually Guy Robert's masterpiece. I think this is what he kind of built up his entire career to create. Um, this... Or um, this, or his, his also his um, sort of. If you're going down the Guy Robert rabbit hole, Dior Essence, Dior Essence and Gold Man by M. Wage are are the two. And I say Gold Man because I have Gold Woman, and it is beautiful. They focus a little bit more on the florals. Um, I also have Gold Gentleman's. EDT and um, Gentleman's EDT is a little bit different. They've taken out some of the civet note, I think, and uh, I almost treat that one like a summer cologne version of Goldman. I prefer that. I actually prefer this version. I would love to find a vintage um, non magnetic cap, but honestly, from what I've smelled with the reformulation, and I've got the um, one that says gold right here instead of right here. So I have no clue what the new version of this is like. Um, but now that I have a snap cap of interlude to compare to my interlude with the magnetic cap that says the name on the collar, um, it lasts a, a lot longer, but the fragrance depth for the whatever it is, eight, you know, eight hours that it lasts on skin or nine hours compared to like 24 hours on the snap cap is, um, you know, it's, it's the longevity. I don't know if I need this to be anymore. This is huge as it is and it lasts forever. And the base is civet musk and you will get musk. You will get powdery musk with the powdery orris. This, even the civet comes off as powdery. Imagine throwing up gold flakes into the air and just watching the gold kind of fall back down to earth. That's gold, man. Um, it feels like one of the most expensive fragrances you've ever smelled. Now, to someone who's not into fragrances like we are, well, maybe almost no one is into fragrances like we are, but um, to somebody who is maybe more on the casual fragrance side of things, um, 99% of time, they're going to smell this and they're going to say, it smells like baby powder. It smells like, um, you know, it smells like a cheap woman's fragrance. Don't, don't, don't buy it. It sucks. And, and, and as a fragrance lover, I'm telling you, once you understand the history behind Goldman and Guy Robert's kind of attempted creations to recreate that 1920s aldehydic floral, L'Envent, Arpege, um, which I still think is the wrong way to say it. And I'm sure someone will correct me and I'll read it and I'll still forget next time. But, uh, I'll just, I'll just show you while we're talking about it here. One of the gems of my collection is Ar Arpege X-Ray. Um, I actually had to open this myself. It was sealed. It was a sealed bottle of the vintage X-Ray. And um, it is stunning. It's one of the one of the best aldehydic, maybe the best aldehydic floral in my collection. Um, I mean, it's almost swoon worthy when you smell it, right? And uh, Goldman does that. Yeah, gold gold man does does has a little bit of this DNA in there. It's really interesting how infatuated Guy Robert was with um with L'Envent's Arpège extra or just Arpège in general. You know, the vintage bottles are out of this world. They have everything. Um they they have um 
uh, you know, you get this, our page kind of has this floral, powdery, um, aldehydic floral, but, um, you know, there's florals in there that you'll smell that you just don't smell very often and done to perfection. You get like a honeysuckle and a neroli, one of the best honeysuckle neroli combination I've ever smelled. There's a camellia flower in there, I believe, which is supposed to be this mute flower, but some people say it adds to the, to the whole blend. And one of the most beautiful iris notes I've ever smelled is in uh, Arpege. Uh, and this ambergris base with kind of benzoin and vanilla and, you know, heavier notes, musk and patchouli and sandalwood. And you get some of that in the way he kind of created DR Essence. And you get some of that in the way he created Gold Man. So when people put this down, it, it's almost just a lack of understanding of the history and what built up to Gold Man from 1983 to come out. They smell it, they write it off. Um, but this is something you have to take time with. Man, I could totally see how if you were like a uh, leader of a country or something like that, that you would want to wear that as your signature scent. It is absolutely regal. Um, fantastic stuff. Okay, so that was number um, seven. Number six is one of my favorite Orientals of all time. And this was created by Joseph Henry Lout. This was created for Joseph Henry Lauder, the husband of... Uh, Estee Lauder, uh, and it's called JHL for Joseph Henry Lauder. And um, it's called JHL. They created this for him because he loved things like Cinnabar, which I don't have a bottle of, but I'm on the hunt for a vintage. And he loved things like YSL's opium, but he wouldn't wear them because they were marketed towards women. So at number, f at number six, we have JHL. And this is a creation by... Um, Bernard Chant, and um, this is also a uh, creation by um, the woman who made y Youth Do by Estee, by Estee Lauder, Estee Lauder's Youth Do, and um, which her name escapes me, but it'll come to me in just a second. Um, her name is... Josephine Catapano. Her name is Josephine Catapano. And Josephine Catapano actually worked with Bernard Shaw to create this. And so they, there's a little bit of youth do in here. You'll smell it if, if you um, know youth do. Very underrated fragrance. Just because our grandmothers wore it in the 50s, don't write it off. Youth do is unbelievable. One of the best orientals. With uh, But there's this orangey vibe that kind of runs through JHL, and it runs straight down the middle, almost like from head to toe. You get this orange-like feel, uh, mixing with the pimento, which is a very uh, commonly used note in the early 80s. You saw it in Patu Pour Homme and JHL, uh, bergamot and lemon, but it's that clove, cinnamon, that cinnamony, labdanum-y, vanilla. Um, there's a little bit of fur, you know, balsam furs to try to keep it masculine to the, to a little bit of greenness, a beautiful rose note in here, patchouli, sandalwood, and that vanilla. And it's a oriental through and through. And it's one of the best, one of the most beautiful orientals in my collection. And, um, what can I say? I mean, I'm blessed to have it. I feel very lucky to have it. And I, I love in the cold. There's sometimes there's nothing better, uh, than, than JHL. It apparently you can still find bottles floating around out there, but it's one of the harder um, Estee Lauder gentleman collection, Aramis gentleman collection to find because whenever he passed away, and he only passed away a year into this being in, in production, so he passed away, I believe, in 83, maybe 84, but that's it. So he only got to wear this for like a year. This was his signature scent, then he passed away. And whenever he passed away, they basically pulled it from the market. Then they reintroduced it later on. Um, but, you know, it didn't have the run of, of um, it didn't have the long tenure that some of the fragrances in the collection had. So sometimes JHL can be one of the harder ones to hunt down. Okay, 
Next on the list is going to be number five. And this is where you guys may question my sanity, but I have to, I'm going to spray this because I have a bottle coming and I, and I sprayed this. Actually, I'm going to put this on skin. Um, I sprayed this on one of my blind sniffing episodes recently, actually the last one. And I instantly bought a bottle and thank God I could find a bottle too. Uh, because I think this is full bottle worthy, maybe even backup bottle worthy. And you can see, I instantly jump some of the greatest fragrances ever. I mean, Gold Man, uh, JHL, uh, you know, Missoni, Womo, YSL, Porum, Hot Concentrate. I just jumped them and put this ahead of it. I love this stuff already. I am in love with this stuff. And this is... Man... I'll tell you what, I don't know how I did not know about this. I don't know how no one in my circle discovered this and told me to buy a bottle, but, oh, fuck. So this is a fragrance called Perak Porom, P-E-R-A-C, Perak Porom. And Perak Porom, it's almost like you took maybe like this fougere structure, almost like, I don't know a note listing. There's no note listing, but I'm guessing you took this like lavender and, you know, bergamot and cyclamen and uh, geranium and you, and you added this big hunk of this leather note, which I am in love with. I love this animalic leather note in here and castorium. This leathery castorium 80s, you know, fragrance from the early 80s, from 82, this came out. This animalic leathery castorium in the base, but this kind of green, earthy, fougere struck construction. And I have no clue what the notes are, but I'm guessing it's, you know, the usual stuff with lavender and all of this, all of these other notes that make up a proper fougere. Maybe a little bit of tonka, maybe a little bit of musk. Um, but it is stunning. It's fantastic. Probably even backup bottle worthy. I got the 100 mil bottle, so I'm not going to buy a backup. I'm just going to accept my 100 mil and, and go from there. But man, Perak Pour Alm instantly jumps to number five from, from 82, 83. Um, and there's no one, hardly anyone owns this. Three people own it on Parfumo. And that includes me. And I just put my own button, you know, like yesterday or something on, on there. So there were two people showing that owned Perak Porom. Wow. What a fragrance. Um, and this is why I love vintage fragrances. I've gone through this before, but this is a great example of why I love vintage fragrances right there. Um, just astounding stuff. Okay, uh, next on the list, number four. Number four is um, a fragrance from 1982 or three, I believe. Uh, 1983, and it's from the extremely expensive house of Balmain. If you ever feel like dropping two grand on a pair of sneakers, this is your house, boys and girls. If you ever feel like buying an $800 t-shirt, this is your house. Um, for me, I only want the vintage perfume, and this is... Eben de Balmain. And Eben de Balmain is um, probably one of my favorite versions of Aramis Tuscany Per Uomo. So this came out a year before Aramis Tuscany Per Uomo, but it followed fragrances like the one I, I mentioned um, in a review yesterday, Fabergé Cellini from 1980. Man, Perak poor old fuck me, man. Oh god, it's not even right. It's not right how good this is and how no one talks about it. And now all the bottles are going to disappear because I said something good about it. I mean, I'm glad I got a bottle, but there's not many. It's it is out there. You can still find Perak poor old, but it it it, it could have been triple what I paid for it on eBay and been worth it. Um so Eben de Balmain has this minty green sort of opening. And I thought I got a little bit of mint vibe from Cellini even. Actually, here they actually list the note as spearmint. So spearmint, artemisia, basil, bergamot, juniper, cinnamon, geranium, rose, and patchouli in the heart. 
the base of leather, amber, frankincense, labdanum, and moss. And the leathery note is amped up here. Um, I think this is the best Balmain fragrance, in my opinion. This is one of these um, hard-to-find, discontinued masculines. But, man, if you can get a good deal on it like I did, go for it. And this is one I actually have a video on because Anuj sent me a mini. And I did a video on it. I love it. So if you really want to know my thoughts, go check out my full review. Um, it's under the Balmain playlist of Eben. Let's see what the little blurb says. I'm always interested to see what the blurb says. The blurb says... What does the blurb say? The blurb says... Ah, it's good stuff. Beautiful. A Ben de Balmain. A fragrance. Sorry, let's start at the beginning. The new Eau de Toilette for Men by Balmain. A fragrance brilliant with the exhilarating freshness of lantana mingled with rare wood notes. An exotic accents of patchouli and vetiver. An arousing, intensely masculine scent. Well, that's good. That's how I like my masculine scents. A line of fragranced grooming and skincare products created for the comfort and pleasure of man. Of man. At their heart, Keratol, an exclusive complex formulated with oil of carrot, carroty, a substance derived from trees of the ebony family and known for its effectiveness in treating the skin. Wow. Okay, that's pretty cool. There's a picture of the Eben tree. Um, I was trying to see if they talked a little more about the fragrance, but no. It's just kind of... Uh, I mean, hell, I'd buy, I'd buy their uh, skincare product. You know, you got me sold. Got the good old days, man. That's how advertising should be today. Some of these, um, you know, marketing executives for some of these big firms should take note from the old days. You know. Some of these scandals going on at some of these big firms maybe would not be happening had they paid attention to how things were done in the past. Okay, next on the list, we've got number three. Top three. Here we go. Big hitters. Um, number three is... Uh, number three is... What can I say about number three? Number three was almost number one, actually. It was almost number one. And any of the top three actually could be number one on any day. And maybe I'm being a little, um, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit on crowning number one, but honestly, I don't think I am. I think, uh, I think I found a, uh, an eighties masterpiece and I am going to try to dip this in there. I'm going to try to anyways, there's a stopper on there, which might stop me, but I think I can. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Lanchetti Uomo. And for those interested, I have a video on Lanchetti Uomo because my good friend Duncan sent me a sample of this and that's what actually made me buy these bottles. Um, Lanchetti Womo also took me years of hunting. Believe it or not, it was not an easy find. This is spicy, woody. It's listed as having notes of absinthe, lemon, white thyme, artemisia, clary sage, galbanum, lavender, mint, and nutmeg. And when you first sm smell it, you will pick up on that green sort of... Um, fresh mintiness. Uh, almost like the mint used in... Uh, Burberry's for Men from 1980. I can't remember exactly the year, but the very first Burberry's fragrance for men has this sort of minty Artemisia lavender thing going on. 
Then you get jasmine and tree moss in the heart with a base of animalic notes, patchouli, ambergris, cedar, labdanum, leather, and sandalwood. And those animalic notes mix with the leather in a way exactly like I like it. If you like the animalic 80s fragrances that I like, Lanchetti Womo is right there. It is um, spicy, woody, leathery, but also has this sort of, um, you know, this sort of uh, green side to it as well. The absinthe, the galbanum, uh, the artemisia, that white thyme note, which is very posh. Even though this is a harsh fragrance to most, there's a soft side to this as well. Once you get to know it, this could be signature scent. Actually, all three, these uh, top three could be a signature scent for me, but Lanchetti Womo, best from the house, hands down, no questions asked in my, in my mind. Best from the house. It is, it is fantastic juice. Okay, um, I'm going to put the second to, to last on the other wrist here. Actually, maybe I'm going to wait. My God, I wish you could smell this Perak Ulm. Perak Ulm might be jumping Ebene if, if we did another list in, in, in a year or two, but uh, I'm actually going to spray this Trusardi over here. So number two is Trusardi Womo. And this is the... Um, this is the Scannon version. However, I will tell you that I own a bottle of the Selective Beauty, and it doesn't matter. Get, get whatever you can get. They're both fantastic. Uh, if you have a choice, go for the uh, Scannon, but um, it, I, I would just get whatever you can get. These are very hard to find. This is the original bottle from 1983. Um, so they've remarketed this in 2011. It has that Greyhound kind of face uh, cap, and it looks different than this. Don't get that one. That's a completely different fragrance. And no, it's not like, oh, it's still good. It's a completely different fragrance. No, this is the one that you want if you're into 80s fragrances. Um, and Trusardi Womo is uh, created by a woman named Beatrice Piquet. And Beatrice Piquet made Lidge L'Enstant de Guerlain for, for Guerlain. And so between Lidge and this, those are her two greatest achievements. And I think even this might outshine Lidge. Um, just, just my opinion. I love Lidge. Don't worry. I've got multiple bottles. But this is... This is something else. I mean, um, it's one of the best Italian leathers, maybe the best Italian leather. The only one that can give it a run for its money, um, my opinion, uh, is Fendi Womo. Fendi Womo and Trusardi Womo go head to head for the best Italian leathers. Maybe even Lanchetti Womo, but Lanchetti Womo has more of this sort of, um, it goes in a different direction. It starts to smell you know, imagine like you're smelling a Jill Sander fragrance from the early 80s. Man, Jill Sander, man, the original. You know, it has more of that sort of, um, you know, very, uh, the castorium in here feels very tamed, you know. But you can definitely get the real castorium and the leather and all that stuff in Lanchetti Womo. Trusardi Womo... It just has this so, this sort of, um, you know, grandmother's spice cabinet that hasn't been opened for 50 years, you know, or it has been opened, but the spices have been in there for 50 years and they've like become part of the cabinet, you know, and it's kind of woody, uh, but there's thyme and uh, all these different spices, marjoram and bay leaf florals. And um, there's this vintage carnation of course and vetiver but the one of the tricks here is there's an iris and leather and it's a leather iris which i've talked about that combination many a times that leather irish com iris combination is a killer for me because uh it just offsets you know that animalic bit uh the the leather is kind of offset by the posh iris and here it's slightly powdery, but what you get more is it's almost like the iris is mixed with the honey, 
okay? And so you get this sort of uh, honey leather, and now you're in the 80s, you're talking animalic honey, you're talking leather, and they've, they've kind of blended it with mosses and frankincense and patchouli, and my God, man, one of my favorite leathers of all time. Uh, could easily be a signature scent. I absolutely adore Trusardi Womo. It's my favorite Trusardi. I like this more than uh, Inside Man, which I love Inside Man. Um, I like this more than Action Womo. I mean, this is uh, this is the the crown jewel of Trusardi for vintage lovers. And finally, number one. And again, you guys may think I'm nuts. I'm not even going to put any on right now because I have a full bottle coming. I'm going to wear it as my scent of the day when it arrives this week. But uh, number one, and uh, I wore this to bed, okay, just the other night, I wore this to bed, and I can tell you that my, um, my opinion of this fragrance only grows, you know, this could be one of the greatest 80s fragrances no one talks about, okay, one of the greatest 80s fragrances no one talks about. If you go to uh, Parfumo, and you, and you, and you plug this in, and you look at what it shows as similar as, that is complete BS. They say that this smells like louder for men. Hell no. This eats louder for men's lunch, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this puts louder for men in the corner crying. This is Hashish Om at number one. This is a mini, thanks to my good friend Armando. And thanks to my good friend Armando, I have a full bottle coming. Well, full bottle minus 10 mil coming. Um, but it's spicy, it's woody, um, it's got this green artemisia opening with fruitiness, and um, when when I say fruits, probably what you're imagining is completely different than how this smells. The focus is on the spicy, woody, leathery, castorium, frankincense bits of the fragrance, but there's a second part of the fragrance behind that smoky, leathery, you know, green, um, 80s, masculine, you know, very singular-minded fragrance. And that's kind of the fruitier, jasmine, carnation, uh, rose, you know, those are the, the fragrance notes that are there and they, they make up this kaleidoscope of a scent that is just, uh, I think when I go watch my... Go watch my blind sniff, okay? Not the most recent one, the one before it. Uh, the most recent one, I had already smelled this. But the one before it, if you want my true early reaction to this, go watch that. And the very first thing I said is, what is this and why is it not in my collection? How do I not know it? What is this, Armando? What have you sent me uh, that I didn't know about? And this is probably, honestly... As far as vintage perfumes go, okay, as far as vintage perfumes go, I've discovered a lot this year. Perak Pour Homme, um, Trittignant, I've got Trittignant coming very soon as well. That's going to compete for Pavarotti with the best celebrity fragrance. I believe it was called Trittignant. I'd have to go take a look. But, um, I mean, as far as, you know, vintage discoveries in 2023, this is number one. Hands down, number one. Um, could maybe even compete with the all-time greats from the 80s. It's that good. Why it's so rare, I have no clue. Um, I can tell you there was an article that came out recently about a fragrance that I hunted for a while called Jean-Marc Sinan, and the article said that this designer basically went and, this was only produced for five or six years, he then went and bought back his bottles and destroyed them, bulldozed them into the ground. Um, and that's why this is so hard to find now, because the designer almost went on a seek and destroy mission. Why Hashish Om is so rare? I have no clue. Uh, it was made by VJ. Uh, v, v, VG or VG? VJ was the producer of this. I don't know how long it ran. I don't know... Fuck. All I know is this fragrance is a little bit of a revelation for me, discovering this. Um, between this and Perak Pour Homme, these two have kind of really revolutionized the way I see 1982 and 1983. 
Uh, I'm very glad to have a bottle of Perak Pour Homme coming. Fuck. Perak Pour Homme, man. Um, this is the unicorn. This is the one you're going to have to fight for. I think Ali got very lucky and he found one as soon as I went. What the hell is this? He went and bought the one bottle that was like available. But um, Hashish... Oh, it was originally called Hashish Om. Okay. They then changed it to like Hashish Men. Uh, and then it just got completely discontinued altogether. So uh, there is also a hashish for women, though. Be careful. It comes in a red box. Completely different fragrance. Never smelled it. But um, yes, I mean, if you are, if you're a unicorn hunter and you trust the ram's nose, this will not let you down. And I'm putting this number one on my 82, 83 video, and it's deserving. I'm going to give it a full wear uh, very soon when it arrives, when my full bottle arrives. But um, thank you to Armando for introducing me to so many of these 80s gems. You know, I thought I had uh, a, a good vintage collection, and that just goes to prove there's always something else in vintage world to get to know. And that's one of the things I love about it. And, um, you know, there's always some other leaf to overturn and discover and learn something new about. Perak Porom and Hashish uh, Alm have been those two in this list, but you know, there's so many things to go out there and discover. So if there's some fragrances from 82, 83 that, uh, you love that is not on the list, leave it in the comments. Let me know what your favorite from the top 16 were. Um, you know, I love doing these videos for you guys, but, uh, they do take time and effort. I have to take all the bottles out and put them back and, you know, update the video and all this stuff. So, uh, liking and subscribing and commenting does help the channel. I very much appreciate everyone who has supported me. Um, and, you know, I love seeing your faces in the comments. I learn more from you than you do from me. It's just a fact. I mean, this proves it. There's just so much knowledge out there. One man cannot know it all. It's impossible. Uh, and, and so the feedback, the back and forth that we've created in our little fragrance town is really something special. And, you know, we welcome... People with open arms that want to learn in this hobby that uh, that are into stuff like this, you know, uh, we can be kind of a real niche inside of a niche, if you will, in the fragrance world, because I like all kinds of stuff. I like actual niche fragrances and I like vintages and I like designers and I like expensive stuff. I like cheap things. I go everywhere. Old, new. I mean, I try everything. Uh, indie, you name it. Ouds. I, I'm starting to really love ouds. So, I'm a little bit of an outlier in, in the fragrance community because I don't just have one thing I focus in on, but vintage is one of my favorites because of stuff like this. I mean, I wish you could smell this Perak Pour Homme. It is unbelievable. So good. So thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video from 8283. Cheers guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.